This podcast is sponsored by Bovida Humidity Packs. Bovida Packs are meant to be stored with your cannabis flower. This helps control the relative humidity inside your jar, which is going to control the cannabinoid and terpene profile of your flower over time, so you'll never have to experience dry, crusty nugs. You may have seen Bovida Packs in the weed bags you buy from the dispensary with your flower, but you can also purchase these for your home use. I highly encourage that you do, especially if you buy your flower in bulk. The packs come in a variety of sizes depending on how much bud you have at home. They are incredibly useful and affordable, and I noticed a huge difference when I started using these and now I could never go back. I also want to note that every single Bovida employee that I have spoken with has been incredibly happy working at this company, and I have so much respect for them for being an ethical employer and helping fund education like this podcast. If you want to purchase some Bovida packs, the links will be available in the show notes of this episode. Welcome back to the Bioactive Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Riley Kirk. Today we have a very special guest and one of my favorite scientists to stay up to date on their research, Dr. Naja Chek. Dr. Chek is an expert on an analytical tool that we call mass spectrometry. This is a tool that's used in so many different realms of research and natural product chemistry being included. This tool allows you to take a sample, like for example, a plant extract, and analyze the different chemical components that are present, and analyze them based on how much they weigh and how the molecules break apart when they're exposed to energy. She now uses this tool to develop new ways to evaluate chemical synergies in nature. We talk about chemical synergies all the time when we're referencing the cannabis plant. We typically call this the entourage effect. However, it's not just the cannabis plant that has these chemical synergies, and I would almost argue that every single natural product has chemical synergies in it, and Dr. Najacek is developing ways to evaluate these synergies in nature. Dr. Chek has researched kratom, golden seal, and echinacea, which we're going to talk about today, among the many other things that she researches in her laboratory. Dr. Chek is a Patricia Sullivan Professor of Chemistry at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. UNC has an amazing natural products program that continues to push out some of the most intriguing research in the field of natural products. She is a mom, a writer, a professor, a researcher, and an awesome person to chat with. Before we get started on this conversation, I wanted to provide everyone with a little bit of background knowledge on the subjects that we're going to discuss today. We're going to discuss a traditional medicinal plant called echinacea or the purple cone flower. If you're watching this on YouTube or you follow the Bioactive podcast on Instagram, you can have a visual of what this plant looks like. Echinacea roots and extracts continue to be some of the top natural supplements in the United States and are mainly used to boost the immune system. Before it was a top supplement in the United States, echinacea was used by indigenous peoples for a variety of purposes. Externally, on the skin, it was used to treat wounds and snake bites, and internally, it was used for sore throats, toothaches, rabies, coughs, and digestive issues. In modern herbal medicine, echinacea is used to ease the symptoms and shorten the duration of colds and flus. It's used to help treat upper respiratory tract infections and to help boost the immune system. There have been conflicting laboratory analyses and human clinical trials on echinacea, with some research showing it to be an effective way at shortening colds and flus and some showing that there is little to no response with echinacea. The phytochemistry, aka the plant chemistry, of echinacea is pretty complex, with different classes of molecules including sugars, glycoprotein, derivatives of caffeine, and a class of molecules called alkylmides. The root of the plant, which has been used the most in traditional medicine, are abundant in these alkylmide molecules. These are long, fatty molecules that are structurally similar to the endocannabinoids that our body makes and have shown to have activity on the CB2 receptor, or the cannabinoid 2 receptor, which is considered a possible mechanism behind the ability for echinacea to modulate the immune system. 
we are going to talk further about boosting the immune system and if this concept could potentially be a good thing or a bad thing and how it might have nothing to do with the alkylamides and rather have to do with the fact that every single plant, fresh plant that we utilize for medicine or food contains bacteria living within it. When we ingest that bacteria into our bodies along with that plant material, our immune systems get stimulated because they recognize that there is some foreign bacteria present. Bacteria or fungi that live within a plant are called endophytes. So you would say an endophytic bacteria or an endophytic fungi are living within an organism. And every organism contains them, including your own body, which is home to many different endophytic bacteria. So thank your bacteria as we welcome Dr. Naja Cech onto the show. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat. Ah, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Riley. I'm really excited. Awesome. Can you um, actually, so when I first heard you give a talk at the American Society of Pharmacognosy meeting a few years ago, I remember part of your talk was talking about living in a yurt. I believe that was that was the topic. <laughs> there might have been mention of the yurt. You also mentioned your relationship with echinacea really helped, you know, fund your your studies through school and that you had a relationship with the plant, not only on a chemical and research level, but also uh, raising or growing these plants, harvesting the seeds, selling the seeds. So can you just give a little more uh, background on when you started working with echinacea and what that relationship means to you? Absolutely. So the yurt is was my childhood home for a number of years in the 1980s when I was growing up in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon with my folks who were sort of intrepid hippie survivalist types that decided to raise us off grid. And uh, so my brother and sister and I and my parents all lived in a 300 square foot yurt for a number of years. And you can imagine just how much space there is in 300 square feet. Um, so it was, it was very close. Um, no indoor plumbing, uh, but a really beautiful setting uh, out in the Oregon wilderness. And I spent a lot of time hanging out with the goats and hiking in the woods and um, exploring the natural world and also in the garden and in the garden with my dad a lot. And my parents actually established a company that is still operational today that's called Strictly Medicinal, which is a seed company. And so my experience of my first experience with echinacea was both growing echinacea, using echinacea uh, when I was sick. You know, my dad would give us some very strong tasting echinacea tincture when I had a cold. Um, and then also um, growing echinacea seeds and putting them in little packets and writing on the packets with a ballpoint pen the name and the genus and species of the plant. And so that was... That was a very different way of, of studying echinacea that gave me a really personal relationship to that plant. And then also we had a big crop of echinacea that um, we sold to be used to make medicine. And that was what funded my first year of university. So, um, and also was the topic of my first research grant. So I'm very appreciative to echinacea because <laughs> without echinacea, I would not have been able to even become a scientist. So probably not very surprising that one of the things that we chose to study in my lab was echinacea. That is so interesting. And there's there's really multiple components of what makes echinacea medicinal. Um, I think that's kind of what you have found through your studies. There's that traditional like phytochemical component where almost every plant has some form of like antioxidant or, you know, antimicrobial effect or something like that. But you kind of found something interesting with your recent studies uh, that what is what I consider kind of a paradigm shift, because we know that a lot of natural products, if not all of them, have bacteria and fungi living in them, on the outside of them, among them. They're just kind of part of that ecosystem. Uh, but we attribute a lot of the medicinal benefits of echinacea to its immune system stimulating effects in our body. 
And that may not actually be from the molecules that the plant makes. It could potentially be from the bacteria that the plant harnesses inside of it, and that stimulates our immune system. So would you mind just kind of giving a quick breakdown of what your research has found in this in this realm of the bacteria being involved in the immune system? Yeah, so that was a really great summary, Riley. Um, I think that what's... So we, I definitely started out working with echinacea, looking for molecules that echinacea makes and looking specifically at a set of molecules called alkylamides, which are pretty widely distributed among plants. There's a number of different plants that make them. One is like the Szechuan peppercorn. So even if you've never had echinacea, you might have had in Chinese food Szechuan peppercorns that kind of numb your mouth and are really tingly when you consume them. And those, so I always call alkylamides tingle molecules. Um, they're just, and and if you have a lot of them, it'll it'll almost make you like drool uncontrollably. So, this was a <laughs> this was a game we used to like to play with unsuspecting people when we were little was to give them like a, a piece of a plant that contains a lot of alkylamides and then see if they how would they would respond to this profound tingling and drooling experience. Um, so yeah, That's so awesome. that, yeah, so so al alkylamides are really interesting, and and echinacea was used to uh, treat toothaches, um, is by indigenous peoples of North America. And that's probably because of that numbing um, property that it has. But there was a lot of interest in echinacea alkylamides in the immune system um, when I started studying echinacea. And so I was originally expecting alkylamides to stimulate an immune response because a lot of the literature on echinacea talked about its ability to say stimulate the immune system and prevent infection. But the confusing thing about all that is that from the perspective of an immunologist, you may or may not want to stimulate the immune system when it comes to um, treating an infection. And in fact, the immune system is a really complex thing. It's not one thing. And so there's, there's sort of um, different types of immunity. And one type of immunity is the is the types of immune cells that their job is to mount an, a defense against invaders. So in the macrophages of the immune system play a big role in that. So um, macrophages protect us from um, invading organisms like bacteria. And so um, it turns out that sometimes if that immune response is too strong, it can make us quite sick. Um, and so sometimes the immune system is almost overreacting, uh, and that's what we describe as inflammation. So you can have chronic inflammation, like something like arthritis, um, or you know irritable bowel syndrome, or something like that. But you can also have acute inflammation, like the runny nose and sneezing and coughing that comes along with a cold. And so um, originally, people thought that echinacea was helpful for stimulating an immune response, but then later we realized that it seems like the alkylamides from echinacea are actually more helpful for suppressing some of those symptoms that are actually an indication of overreacting immune system. So that was the first surprise, was like I was expecting that alkylamides were gonna stimulate, but they seem to more suppress those macrophage cells that are part of that immune response. But then there's another piece, which you just alluded to, which is the bacteria inside the plant and when we see the immune cells being stimulated, when we grow immune cells in a Petri dish, we do sometimes see them being stimulated. And that's when we have a lot of bacteria inside the samples that we're using to treat those immune cells. And I didn't expect this initially when we started working with echinacea, but it turns out that plants have a microbiome just like people do. So the plant microbiome is interacting with the human microbiome when we consume plants. And obviously our microbiome is a very complex thing and we get bacteria all different ways, but one way is by eating raw plants that have living bacteria in them. And so, and part of the immune response is happening in the digestive system as well. So it, the, when we talk about macrophage cells protecting us against bacteria, that's happening in the bloodstream because of course, you don't want bacteria circulating around in your bloodstream. That's very bad. But there's all kinds of bacteria in your gut all the time. And when you consume an echinacea plant, you're getting bacteria from that echinacea plant. Now that's also true when you consume a carrot 
or a salad. So it may or may not be something unique to echinacea that that's happening. And so that's that was really, kind of my question, yeah. just kind of, right. you know, is, is, is there something really special about echinacea that fosters the growth of some specific bacteria that could be beneficial to, you know, some sort of stimulating effect that other bacteria don't really possess. So that kind of mm -hmm. makes echinacea this special medicinal plant because it harbors that that special bacteria. And I don't think we have the information to, to know that yet because we're still like very early in exploring the microbiota yeah. of plants and how it differs from plant to plant and in different growing conditions and what time it's harvested and how long those bacteria kind of yeah. stick around. Yeah, those are all good questions. Yeah, I... I mean, my 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 guess, my just guess of an answer to that question, and what is based on some of the work we've done in my lab, was that would be that the answer is probably no. Um, I don't think that the microbes you find when you cultivate echinacea are so specific to the genus and species of echinacea as much as they are a reflection of the environment it comes from. And we actually did a study where we grew echinacea in three different totally totally separate. Um, places, two, two sites in North Carolina and one in Oregon, wait, two sites in Oregon and one in North Carolina, and we, we collected the roots and we cultured bacteria out of them, and we found very different bacterial populations. And that would not surprise um, somebody whose expertise is, is endophytes, is the organisms that live inside plants, because that has been shown time and again that a lot of that um, composition of the bacterial um, microbiome of a plant is reflective of its history and environment, just like our microbiomes are totally different. So I'm sure, Riley, you and I have very different microbiomes depending on where we grew up, what we were exposed to, you know, what foods we eat, um, what antibiotics we've taken, things like that. So um, what, to me, what it says is that, you know, to the extent that our immunity is being altered by the the, the bacteria that we consume, where our food was grown and where it came from matters a lot um, or could matter a lot. And so, so I, the way I think about it, just to simplify this for listeners, is that echinacea provides unique phytochemistry that might actually help with treating inflammation that's associated with um, an infection, essentially suppressing that undesirable immune response, but also that any food that you eat um, is bringing with it its own microbiome, and that may in some way have an impact on your health related to immunity and other things <laughs> that bacteria do, right? So, um, so like you said, though, Riley, I think that that part of it, we're still at very early stages of studying. Yeah, and, and that's really interesting because I think when some people are feeling themselves start to get sick or maybe you were very like af afraid of the world during COVID, I think a lot of us were, uh, a lot of people started to take different supplements from plants and fungi. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. We all kind of wanted to, you know, quote, boost our immune system. And we might Google what plant helps boost my immune system. Yeah. Echinacea might have come up. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, you might be taking in these kind of beneficial bacteria, but it if your immune system's already in kind of a tough place with fighting a different infection and introducing the bacteria that are part of echinacea, I mean, it could potentially be a good thing or potentially be a bad thing if we're introducing too much to our immune system and causing our immune system to kind of have to work too hard. Um, I don't know if there's really any like data on that, but... Well, I think it... Again, I, I think that, that f I don't think consuming echinacea is too different than eating any raw food in that way. Like, I don't think you need to worry, oh my gosh, I'm going to have echinacea and it's going to overstimulate my immune system any more than you have to worry, I'm going to eat some carrots and they're going to overstimulate my immune system. So yeah. I think, I also think that a lot of times what people are consuming when they consume echinacea is a tincture um, yeah. or a capsule of dried material. And there's probably not a lot of living microbes in that anymore, although there may be some microbial components. But those are um, so and those are not really going to get into your immune system so much, probably directly anyways. They're going to get broken down in your digestive system. Um, so, right. 
So I, I think actually with COVID, there was this concern like, oh, echinacea stimulates the immune system. Maybe there's a risk of using echinacea at the same time as um, having COVID, or maybe it's going to make COVID worse because part of what's bad in COVID is this cytokine storm, all these um, all these cytokines that are being produced by your immune system that can be really you know detrimental. And um, I think that part of that, this is my guess, I'm not a doctor, I'm not making recommendations for how one would treat one's health, but I think a lot of that fear around the immune stimulating properties of echinacea is a misinterpretation of experiments where people are growing echinacea in a petri dish and seeing that the bacterial components are stimulating immune cells, whereas it would those components would not necessarily end up circulating through the bloodstream. Gotcha. Um, in the body. So I, I kind of see that as this is one of the really hard things about studying bioactive molecules from plants is that we try to use these models that are simplified, like, oh, let's take some immune cells and grow them in a Petri dish, and that'll be representative of the human immune system. But of course, the human immune system is way more complex than that. We have all different types of immune cells, which are all interacting with each other. We have the um, innate and adaptive immune responses that are mediated by totally different types of cells. We have what's going on when you consume something, it's being digested and broken down, and then only part of it is making it into the system. There's metabolism happening. So obviously a human is way more complicated than ev what you can ever do in a Petri dish. So it's, I think we have to be very careful about taking results from what we call in vitro studies that are done in, um, in a test tube or a Petri dish and then extrapolating them to a human. Absolutely. Um, and so just to go back to kind of the alkylamides, because that's, uh, you know, you've done some research on that. And I was doing additional research on that. And I think it's really interesting that these molecules look really similar to the endocannabinoids that our body mm, makes, yes, our, yes. our endogenous cannabinoid-like molecules. Mm -hmm. And they're like these like long chain fatty molecules. Yes. Um, and these, it has been documented that some of these, of these alkylamides can bind to both the CB1 and CB2 receptor, yep. and that's your cannabinoid one and cannabinoid two receptor, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. more affinity towards the CB2 receptor. Do you think that most of the bioactivity for the alkylamides has to do with that interaction? Or if there's additional pharmacology going on there that maybe we haven't discovered yet? Because that discovery wasn't made until 2006, and echinacea had been a top supplement for many, many years before that, which is really interesting that people knew it was working in their body. They knew it was doing something, but we just didn't have the data to back it up at the time. And then that study was published, which I'll link in the show notes, um, that really started to d divulge why echinacea does have these different medicinal benefits. Yes, um, I think that there's there's been some great research on echinacea, alkylamides, and the cannabinoid receptors, and they're definitely, I think you put it really well, Riley, that it seems like there's part of the effect that you might see would be mediated by those receptors, and there's also other stuff going on. Um, I would also say that the, the potency that we see for alkylamides is not very high. And so it takes a lot of those molecules to start to see an effect. And this is another one of the challenges with extrapolating studies done with receptors, isolated receptors in test tubes to the human body. Um, there's some question as to whether we get enough of a dosage of alkylamides when we consume echinacea to see those effects. And there have been a mo number of clinical studies on echinacea, actually, where people are dosing patients with echinacea and seeing what it does, and several of the largest, bet, what one might make, consider the best design studies in terms of being placebo controlled and double blinded, showed no effect of echinacea. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm asked quite often by people who say, well, does echinacea work? You know, like, what do you think? And I, um, I always, the, the negative results of those clinical studies always gives me pause because I like to look at clinical studies when I decide whether or not um, something is effective. And yet I, oh, also yeah. know, I also know that I talk to a lot of people who report really beneficial results from using echinacea and, and, and I'm comforted by the fact that all the studies on toxicity have shown that echinacea is very safe. So 
again, not a doctor, but looking at those data, I think, well, if people are reporting a benefit from using echinacea, and if some of the cl smaller clinical studies did show some positive results, you know, then maybe there is something to it. And one of the real challenges there is dosage. So we do our best to select a good dosage when we do a clinical study, but if we're not sure what the active molecules are, it's really hard to select the right dosage for a botanical. And so one of the questions that has been raised repeatedly with those clinical studies is, was it the correct dosage used in those studies? And you know, I think the scientists did a really good job to the best of their ability of selecting the material and the dosage they did for that study, but ultimately those results, or several studies actually, um, one done in Germany that looks at prevention and another two studies done in the United States that look at um, treatment of, of uh, the common cold. Um, so, you know, I just, I don't want to jump to the conclusion that echinacea quotes works for treating colds, um, but I think a lot of people are still using it. It's still a top selling supplement and they're reporting beneficial effects. Um, well, and it's, it's good to know that it, that it does have a great safety index that, you know, it's not going to hurt yeah. you if you're taking echinacea and, so. and that's important. Again, I mean, we're not saying take echinacea here. Neither not medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> we can say that the studies do not suggest that it is particularly problematic in terms of having side effects. So, yeah. You know, I this is just something I'm curious about just on the top of my head right now, but because these molecules look really similar to our endocannabinoids and because we know that they can bind to the cannabinoid receptors, I guess my question would be I wonder if the same enzymes that break down our endocannabinoids could potentially break down these molecules too, and that would prevent some of those biological mm -hmm. effects from happening in our body, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't translate to those Petri dish experiments, because this is the same reason why we just can't dose people with endocannabinoids, because our body's just going to metabolize them mm -hmm. immediately. They're not going mm -hmm. to actually make it to the site where it matters. Mm -hmm. So. I wonder if that structure structure mm. similarity has anything to do with that, but that's just a theory, hypothesis, something something to think that's about. That's super interesting. A super interesting suggestion, Riley. And I think what you're bringing up is another important caveat for us to think in, about when we're um, trying to translate from a petri dish to a human, which we can't really do, which is the the challenge of um, of the metabolism and what role that plays. Yeah. It's always a challenge and it can be super uh, unpredictable for sure. And mm -hmm. so just to be on time here, we're about halfway through this. So I want to kind of switch to talking about uh, researching other complex natural products. Um, mm -hmm. This is something the cannabis industry is always super, super interested in. We call it the entourage effect or the entourage effect theory, essentially saying, you know, the sum of the parts is, is greater than the whole that you have all these different molecules and these natural products and that there's a lot of synergy, but that's not the way that we traditionally research medicinal plants or fungi or anything. We typically are looking for the most active molecule in an extract for a, for a specific target. And that's usually the one we kind of hunt down and isolate, elucidate the structure and then publish on. Um, but there's, I think anyone who uses natural products probably has the sense that there is synergy in natural products and using these complex extracts is, is very different than using an isolated molecule. And you recently published a paper, which again, I'm going to link in the show notes that has a new approach to studying and identifying synergies in nature. But I thought it was also really cool. You were also looking at like antagonism too, if there was you know, is there a pro of having all these things together or could there potentially be a negative of having all these different molecules together? So I would love for you to kind of just describe what this new approach to discovering synergies is and, and why your lab like finds that so important to research. This idea of synergy of multiple molecules working together to, an ex to exert an effect is one that's been talked about for a really long time. In fact, I remember hearing about it for the first time from Jim Duke, who's a notorious ethnobotanist. Um, and I was probably like 10 or 11 years old at a herbal retreat, and he was talking about this idea of synergy, which the cannabis community recently has renamed the entourage effect, but they're talking about the same thing. Um, and you also hear people refer to it sometimes as polypharmacology. Um, that, so you, you'll hear all those terms uh, bandied about, but um, 
all as you just beautifully said, the idea that the um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And it's really sort of the driving principle that people use when they argue for why it might be different to use um, a, a, an herbal medicine, a complex mixture as compared to a pharmaceutical preparation, which is usually a single isolated molecule. And a lot of times it's talked about as if those two things are oppositional, but the reality is that most of us are using both of those things in our everyday lives. You know, if you have a severe infection, you may need an antibiotic. Um, if you are at risk from getting a virus, you may need a vaccine. But if you um, are drinking your tea or your coffee in the morning, you are consuming a complex plant extract. And that, as we know, has physiological effects you know we we don't feel so good without our coffee right so <laughs> this 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 the, and and you wouldn't just drink a, eat a caffeine pill in the morning right like you would drink your coffee there's a very different experience to having completely this different wonderful mixture that has these amazing aromas and amazing flavors that are coming not just from caffeine but from tannins and volatile molecules and these fl these flavor compounds and so um I think it's funny because it's it's almost like this idea of complexity like has been been um, pegged as something that's like specific to herbal medicines, but really it's just the human experience, you know. Have a great yeah. Indian food meal, and what you're getting is all kinds of different spices all together. And nobody would say, "Oh, can we just put it in a pill?" What makes an Indian food meal delicious? <laughs> like, of course not. Like, what would be what would be the pleasure in that, right? So. Um, the challenge, the question you were actually asking me was, how do we go about then in a rigorous scientific fashion, taking something that is a complex mixture of molecules and figuring out which ones of those molecules are important to exerting a biological effect? And in set, sort of moving away from this idea of single molecule, single target to maybe multiple molecules, multiple targets, and can we figure out um, what that signature is, what that profile is that makes a medicinal plant um, effective for whatever purpose. And I think the first thing I would say is that what molecules those are depends on what purpose you're looking at, right? So we were yes. just talking about the complexity of echinacea and the fact that are you looking to stimulate the immune system or maybe what you want to do is suppress it? Well, those are going to be different molecules that are doing those different things and they're going to have different targets potentially in different parts of the body. Um, so, um, what a, a lot of the work that we've done in my lab on synergy has been looking for antimicrobial molecules, molecules that inhibit the growth of, um, bacterial pathogens like MRSA, you may have heard of before, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which exists as a problem because we used methicillin to try to treat um, infections and then staph, the, the bacteria became resistant to methicillin and now we have the superbug, it's even harder to kill. And so one of the ideas is, well, maybe we can try to kill the, the bacteria using a bunch of molecules at once and maybe that's harder for the bacteria to become resistant to those. This seems like a good time for an important PSA because this is also something that I have researched in graduate school. First and most important, if you are prescribed antibiotics from your doctor, please, for the love of frogs, take them all. The reason antibiotic resistance is getting so bad and has gotten so bad is not just the overprescription of antibiotics, but also people not finishing their prescribed antibiotics. When you don't finish antibiotics, some bacteria from that infection will remain, which are resistant to that antibiotic. So when the infection gets bad again, it won't be able to be killed by the same medicine because now it's essentially a super colony of resistant organisms. What Dr. Check is talking about here is using a variety of active molecules to kill an infection instead of just one drug. In this way, it would be more difficult for the bacteria to develop resistance because all the different molecules are killing the bacteria in different ways. Um. So in our research with, with looking at antimicrobial properties, one of the things that we have done is to use mass spectrometry, which is a tool that 
actually my, my training is as a mass spectrometrist originally, um, and that's a tool that's really good for looking at many molecules all at once in a complex mixture. And so we capture the chemical profile of what's in the sample, and then we compare that to um, many different samples. So we either have collected multiple samples from different sources, let's say different plant extracts or different fungal yep. extracts, or we have a single extract and we've separated it out using some technique, some chromatographic technique that allows us to take a mixture of maybe 100 molecules and separate that out into maybe 10 mixtures of 10 molecules. Um, and then we take- Just make it like easier to work with and easier to kind of understand what that chemistry is in each of those those pools yeah that's part of it and also if you're trying to track down which of the if you've got a hundred things in a mixture and you want to know which ones are having activity you have to separate it out somewhat because otherwise you'll never be able to separate the effect of one molecule from the effect of another molecule like you have to create mixtures that have different abundance of those molecules because every otherwise even if you said oh well let me look at different concentrations of this mixture and see what it does you still have a hundred candidates for what did the thing <laughs> until you separate it out so the simplification yeah. makes it easier to to characterize the chemistry but also makes it easier to link the chemistry to the biological effect so awesome. so that's the first step so you asked me how we go about finding synergists the first yep. step is taking either taking a bunch of mixtures that happen to have different amounts of the molecules you're interested in or more likely creating those mixtures yourself by taking an extract and separating it out and then we use mass spectrometry to profile the molecules that are in all of those mixtures and then we use um, mathematical algorithms that allow us to compare the chemical composition with the biological effect and the paper that you're referring to that we just published was on a sort of a new way of handling that mathematics to address the fact that there's not always a linear relationship between the abundance of the chemical or the abundance of the molecule, let's say, that's in the sample and its biological effect if synergy is involved. So um, it's actually a rather simple algorithm. The idea is to take the abundance of each molecule alone and combine those abundances together and then look at instead of trying to correlate the abundance of a single molecule correlate the abundance of the combined abundance of multiple molecules with the biological effect so very cool and so for where this um, metabolomics uh, platform is at right now, you're looking at one specific biological activity. So if it helps to, you know, kill Staphylococcus aureus, like yep. that's yep. your biological activity. And then you're looking mm -hmm. for synergies of different molecules that are able to mm -hmm. work together mm -hmm. to uh, do that. So do you think in the future it would be possible to kind of integrate different targets or different mm -hmm. biological activities but use the same uh you know dip, the same metabolites the same plant extracts yes. or fungal extracts that's going to be really really yes. really cool <laughs> yes absolutely and there are some groups that are doing that um my colleague roger lennington who's at simon fraser university published a, a um a platform called np analyst um very recently and that approach is more looking at having multiple biological readouts in combination and correlating that with chemical composition. So um, there are there are groups that are moving in that direction, and he's one of our collaborators. So we're working on integrating some of the chemical complexity approaches with those biological complexity approaches. Um, so look for that in the future. Oh, I will. I, I saw that he was on that paper, and I, th I think that's really, really interesting. It's just, again, like, I'm always kind of, I know a lot of my audience is mainly interested in cannabis, and that's kind of why I keep kind of bringing this up. Sure, but yeah. people, are in, people are interested in other natural products, too. There's just so much less information out about yeah. so many other natural products, especially uh, in forums like podcasts and, you know, different interviews. And when we think about the entourage effect in cannabis, we think about you know, cannabinoids are binding to the cannabinoid receptors. Like we get that check, but then we have all these different terpenes. And yeah. I think we're all still really 
not confused on what terpenes do, but how the sum of all these different terpenes determines how that mm-hmm. plant product is going to make mm-hmm. you feel. And mm-hmm. a lot of what we have now is it we have data on these specific terpenes like alpha pinene and you know beta myrcene, sure. but but we don't. But the data is not necessarily relevant for how that product's going to make us feel. It's relevant mm-hmm. for like. Again, like an antimicrobial, it like kills property. bacteria. Yep. Yeah, it's like, okay, that's fun. But like, why do I feel stimulated when I try yeah. these different products that have these? So yeah. I think it'll be really interesting to see the cannabis industry start to integrate more with the natural products community because people yeah. like you and and Dr. Lindington, they're producing these really, really cool platforms to study these really complex uh, plant extracts and I'm ex- and I I just don't think a lot of people in cannabis know that natural products is a field of study sure. uh, that is really really important for understanding how these plants work in our body. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that a lot of those tools can be applied to um, to study cannabis as well. And one of the challenges is that when you're talking about how something makes you feel it's so hard to come up with an assay in a Petri dish that represents how you feel. (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah. A lot of times that's why we end up with these experiments that are telling you about whether you kill bacteria, because it turns out it's really easy to grow bacteria in a Petri dish and see whether or not they die. Like you can tell by looking at the Petri dish, whether the bacteria are alive or not. But when you're trying to do something like these assays with pain, right? So like how, you know, impacts on chronic pain or acute pain, or um, ex- or or on you know um, the the impacts in the brain and you know, mood like any mood, of these like feelings really of subjective yeah yeah subjective. so where does you know how do you put euphoria into a petri dish so it's funny it's like a lot of the work that I've done is about how do we do a better job of correlating the biological results with the chemical results so that we're not simply asking is a single molecule responsible but looking at the profile of molecules that could be responsible. So that's an important piece of this question, but the piece that's hardest to work out is, okay, what biological response do we measure? Because we can't just take, you know, we can't just take a human and give them different mixtures from cannabis and pure compounds and see how they do, because that would be unethical and unsafe. So, um, all a hundred percent. So, so that's, and then, and then, you know, there's a lot of studies that are done on animals. Um, for example, you know, there's pain assays that are done in animals where they they have like a tail flick assay or they put a a mouse's foot on a hot plate and they see what it does. Um, you can't really ask a mouse, um, how, whether it's in a good mood, but maybe you can look at mouse behavior to try to represent that. But there's a lot of people that are uncomfortable with doing animal model studies as well, and they're very expensive, and it's hard to do on small um, scale. And you know the ethics of that are questionable as well because you're subjecting animals to pain. So, um, yeah, it's just a really. It's the more I've worked in this area, the more I've felt like the the biological assay development part is the part that we struggle with the most. I think about that all the time because kind of as you were talking about with the antimicrobial effects, that stuff, it's visual. It's great for like undergraduates to learn to do too. Uh, It can be high throughput, um, but it's very, well, one, you don't see many new assays coming out uh, when you read uh, publications or at least I don't, maybe I'm reading the wrong ones, but um, I don't see like a new, a bunch of new assays coming out. And often they're so, so expensive when they do yeah. come out and that, yeah. and that limits so much research. But at the same time, we're trying to bring validity to the cannabis industry yeah. specifically with these peer reviewed publications and, and trying to instruct different patients or different people who use these products, you know, oh, you have fibromyalgia. Oh, you have chronic pain. You should try these products. But we just don't have that information yet. So that kind of lacks the validity there. Um, So a lot of times we still rely on survey data, which is kind of like, here, dose yourself and let us know how you feel. But instead, it's like people purchasing things from a dispensary and then certain apps or websites are tracking how people with certain you know, ailments are feeling. So again, I I think we kind of just agree on this, just kind of huge gap that we're going to work on filling. Um, but it's very, very difficult to fill that gap. Yes. And I would say that like beyond, I I would just, just say that beyond the simple, the fact that antimicrobial assays are simple, you know, 
bacterial infections are a huge problem too. It just happens to not be the major thing cannabis is being used for. So, so if your goal is to find a new way to treat a bacterial infection, an antimicrobial assay makes a lot of sense. But if your goal is to figure out where um, cannabis is helpful for fibromyalgia or or seizures, <laughs> um, yeah. then the antimicrobial assay is probably not super relevant. And I think a lot of the findings of, oh, terpenoids are important, might not necessarily be findings that have been using the most relevant assays. So I'm not saying that that the, terp the terpenes are not important in cannabis. Um, I think that we have to be very careful not to interpret that there's an absence of evidence to mean there's an absence of something being relevant. It's just that there's more work to be done. Couldn't agree more. And kind of to your point earlier about metabolism, like we don't really know specifically when you smoke something, sure. we don't understand, you know, how that product changes and how it's metabolized. So that's, you know, very complex as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I appreciate your input on that too. I, I know you don't research cannabis, but you're so integrated into the field of natural products. I think your perspective is really important just for, you know, sometimes people say, oh, we have no research, so it must not do anything. And that's, right. that's just not the case. Yeah. yeah. Not, the fact that, yeah, that's like saying I didn't test whether or not there's lead in this water. So the water must be safe <laughs> to drink. Like the fact that we didn't test it doesn't mean it's not there. Actually, sometimes even when you test it, you don't get the answer, but that's because your method wasn't able to detect the thing that you were looking for. So we have to be really careful about how we interpret our findings. So for the last 10 minutes of this podcast, I just want to ask you a few questions about you and your personal life and what keeps you motivated and inspired because part of the goal of this podcast is to get the next generation really interested in natural products and interested in research or just pursuing what they love. And you have been such an inspiration for so many natural product chemists. You do such cool research. You're always putting out awesome information. But you're also a mother. You're also, you know, really, really just balanced gardener and, you know, just natural product person. And I just would love to ask you a few questions and have you also just talk about anything that you want to at this point. But I just guess to start, you know, what are some ways you stay inspired? Well, you mentioned gardening and the garden definitely inspires me. I think when I spend time with plants, um, it makes me really, um, I learn a lot from spending time with plants. So I also learn a lot from researching plants in the lab. And I like having those two things both as part of my life um, and see them not as oppositional, but as different pieces of the whole of, you know, being uh, a whole person. Um, we're talking about whole plant extracts, but I think, you know, the whole, being a whole person is important as well. So, um, and sometimes if we focus too much on any individual aspect, then others can start to suffer. Um, I, I really get a lot of inspiration from my students. I'm super fortunate to have a lot of people that are part of the research projects we do, collaborators, um, postdocs, grad students, undergraduate students who all have really exciting ideas and everybody brings their own life experience to the table and contributes in different ways. And sometimes I think that the opportunity of getting to interact with those people and learn with them and learn from them is almost as important, if not more important than the specifics of the findings that we come up with. Um, so yeah, so keeping, you know, for me, there's something really amazing about being able to see molecules with a mass spectrometer. Like whenever stu my students know that, like, if you really want to make me happy, come bring some, bring me a chromatogram, bring me some data that shows <laughs> some peaks on it that represent molecules. And I always get excited. Um, but I also, I also want to be out like digging in the dirt and listening to the birds and watching the bees buzzing around on the rosemary plant. Um, so that's all part of it. And, and you mentioned being a mom, you know, it's, it's really wonderful to me that part of the role of being a chemistry professor is a lot of flexibility. So I have the opportunity to choose my hours that I work and, you know, to, um, spend a lot of time with my kids, um, during hours that might otherwise, I might otherwise have to be at work. So that's been a really good opportunity. And, also, I think it's important for our kids to see us 
you know, doing, following our dreams and, um, and doing important things in the world. And, and my daughter now, who's 14, my daughter Nova says that she really wants to be a scientist and I don't know what she'll choose to do. You know, I am, I totally embrace whatever path she wants to take, but, um, it's funny for years I've told her like, you know, honey, you don't have to be a scientist just cause I'm a scientist. It's okay. I don't expect you to be a scientist. And recently she was like, mom, I actually like science. Like, you don't have to worry. I'm not just doing this to make you happy. Like, I actually think it's cool. So, Wait, that's, that's so satisfying. precious. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And and just your point, too, about, like, loving being in the garden and seeing the bees and the flowers. I think that's just another way you just – you can't escape the sense of nature's complexity. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when, you're, when it's all around you, when you're digging in the dirt and you see the worms and the grubs and the yeah. bugs and – yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, beautiful. and then, you know, then you think about the molecules and then it's just, then yeah, it's just a it, whole nother. It's mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I've been doing a lot of reading about science lately and I've been, um, intrigued by how sometimes we think of science as being, becoming overly mechanistic and making us, um, like reducing the world to something that's too simple or too mechanical. And, but then there's another line of thought, which is that science enhances poetic wonder and like isn't there something about knowing when you look out at the night sky that you're seeing galaxies that extend far beyond your imagination and that those are stars and that the the you know the very atoms that we are made of were born in the hearts of stars like doesn't that doesn't that make you appreciate the beauty of the world even more and so i i like thinking about science not as something that's um, somehow in opposition to being, you know, a, a spiritual person or a person who, um, who appreciates art and is creative, but actually science as part of that creative process and is something that can really enhance our, our enjoyment of what it is to be human. I, I love that. And, you know, when I was going through grad school or going through that journey, I kind of had ups and downs with my mental health, like constantly, yeah. as almost everyone yeah, does. does. Yep. Uh, yeah. And I just found that uh, nature and art were like the two things that saved me. Like constantly, mm -hmm. if, if I was having like a bad time in the middle of the day, I would just escape to the woods or I'd go home and I would paint something just like really fun and had mm -hmm. nothing to do with research, nothing to do with anything, just whatever my brain wanted to produce. I would produce that and that was so like healing constantly and mm -hmm. I highly encourage undergraduates graduates anybody who's stressful stressed stressed out in any way you don't even need to be in school but I mean just explore ways to just kind of change how your brain thinks mm -hmm. and just like mm -hmm. switch it up give your brain a break don't just kind of keep hammering and hoping for uh, a <laughs> change but <laughs> right. right great advice yeah Ryan. great advice yeah thank you um and then I guess another question I just would love to ask uh, is, do you use natural products? And if you do, what are your favorite natural products to use? Well, I would say that the, the way I mostly use natural products is in cooking. I'm a really, um, I'm a really, uh, I would say committed cook. I cook f all the time and that's another creative outlet for me. And I grow a lot of things that I cook. So you know, I grow lots of herbs and I grow cilantro and I grow rosemary and I grow thyme and I grow um, parsley and, and, you know, that those herbs are the ones that are a big part of my um, everyday life. And I truly believe that, you know, there's a healing process to growing food um, and there's a healing process to cooking and there's a healing process that's very real to consuming those um, that complex phytochemistry. So I try to I try to get as many phytochemicals as I can in my life, mostly through diet. And um, I also think about um, the profound changes that happen in our bodies when we are um, out in nature, interacting with those phytochemicals and breathing breathing trees and you know all of that. So um, so those would be some of my favorites. <laughs> That's, that's a great answer. And when you grow your own plants, you're kind of controlling that microbiome oh, of yeah. the plants that, that you're producing. You better producing. believe it, Riley. I mean, I think about how when we have commercial agriculture, we're using fossil fuels as a way of putting in nitrogen as opposed to maybe cover cropping or putting in animal manure or compost. And I just, I don't have 
specifics of how that's different, but I personally do believe that um, that humans and plants have co-evolved in, in our relationships with microbes and that um, we can sort of take that back a little bit by by doing more, either growing food ourselves or, or supporting farmers that are doing it in more of a sustainable way. Absolutely. So thank you for sharing that for sure. And thank you so much for being on this podcast. It was great talking to you. I'm going to try my hardest to get to ASP this year, American Society okay. of Pharmacognosy. Um, and then hopefully I'll see you there. That'd be great. Thank you for having me, Riley. It's been a real pleasure. I love this conversation with Dr. Check in discussing synergies in nature, and I hope you did too. Just as a friendly reminder, if you like this podcast and want to contribute to the conversation about future episodes, get free resources like my guide to cannabis and anxiety, I highly recommend you signing up for my Patreon. You can become a member for as little as $1 a month, and you can be the first to know about what courses are released, special webinars, research opportunities, new publications, merchandise, and more. Thank you for your support, and I will see you next week on another episode of Bioactive. And thank you one more time for our sponsor of this podcast, Bovida, for making this all possible. Mad love. See you next week.